What's up CNC Woodworkers? My name is Corbin Dunn and in this small series I'm teaching people how to create an epoxy drip bowl, something like this, although in the future you could expand it to other cool interesting shapes like my heart bowl or butterfly bowl. In the first episode I discussed how to actually design the basic shape in Fusion 360. In the second episode I discussed how to create a mold out of wood in Fusion 360 where we're going to actually pour epoxy into to create the bumpy drip shape. In the last episode, the third episode, I discussed tool paths and computer-aided manufacturing, CAM, how to actually design how the CNC machine is going to go ahead and cut out all these little bits. Now we're on to the real deal. We're going to actually jump into the shop and create one of these for real. Some other notes, I'm sharing the Fusion 360 file. Check the description to go ahead and download it. I'm also going to export it as some other formats so it's a little bit easier in case you aren't using Fusion 360. So let's jump right into it. So if I look at the setup for my first operation, I see that I need a six inch by six inch wide piece that's two and a half inches deep. And I'm gonna do that by using some 8.4 stock cherry. 8.4 is roughly two inches thick, but that's nominal. So in real life, it'll be a little less. So I'll plane a couple of those down and glue them together. So the pieces are too wide to fit on my joiner. And I just do a simple trick the piece kind of rocks and it definitely needs to be planed. So I grab a sheet of plywood that's wider than it, but not as wide as my planer. And I take a couple of shims and just shim up the edges so it doesn't do any rocking anymore. And if it doesn't do any rocking, it's gonna probably make that other side flat and not create a bowed piece or wart piece. And this trick works pretty well. I need to hold it in place while I run it through the planer, so I'll just stick a couple screws in. It might be nice to actually make a proper sled that I could do for planing pieces like this on a regular basis, but this works in a quick temp hack motion. Now I'm using a 20 inch planer in this instance, but this would work fine with a 12 inch planer, a regular desktop planer too. I plane the top side first, I do a couple passes till it's flat, then I can remove it from the jig and plane the other side to be perfectly parallel to it. I'm using rough stock so I clean up one edge on the joiner and then I can rip the other edge parallel to it on the table saw and finally cross cut it to the desired sizes that I need. I do it a little bit oversized by say a quarter inch. After the glue dries, I'll take it and clean up one of the edges on the joiner. I can then go over to the table saw and rip it to the required width and final dimensions. My pieces were slightly thicker than they needed to be and so I just ran them through the planer again until they're at the thickness that I wanted to start with, which is two and a half inches thick. Okay, so now it's time to jump over to the CNC machine. I take my stock and I wipe it down on the backside with a acetone rag, just really lightly to remove any residues and dust. I then apply blue tape on top of it. And since this video recorded, I've been actually pushing it down really well with a piece of metal or wood because I've had adhesion issues. I put blue tape down on my table. I also clean it before I put the tape down. Then I take some CA glue and spread it on the bottom of my piece. I'll use some accelerator on the table to make it adhere a little bit quicker, but that's not necessary. You just have to wait longer if you don't have accelerator. And then I stick the piece down. I use this back little alignment jig to align it to be roughly where it needs to be. For this particular operation, precision isn't super important. I like to use a Heimer to indicate in the origin of my piece. I want to indicate in the top left front origin that we designed in this setup. And you don't have to use a Heimer, they're pretty expensive. 
You can also use a wiggler, which I've used for a lot of metalworking, and works just fine. So I start the roughing operation with the 3 8 of an inch bit and let it go to town. I usually record a time lapse, but I forgot to do it for this one. But I do have a time lapse of me doing a different bowl, and you can see the 3 8 inch bit making a really rough finish. Then I put in the quarter inch bit, and it's still pretty rough. And it's not until that quarter inch ball in nose mill that smooths it out really nice. So ignore the fact that the piece is wet right here. I forgot to do the order operations correctly. After I have it off the CNC machine, the first thing I'm going to do is use some silicone sealant around the edge of the piece to contain the epoxy. So that way we can over pour it a little bit and not have it go over the edges. So I'd simply forgotten to do the silicone sealant on the edge first, and I went ahead and sealed it first. This is some quick sealing epoxy, and check out my description for exactly which epoxy I'm using. It will start to firm up in about 40 minutes, which gives me enough time to seal the epoxy and not have it leak out any air bubbles. I can then pour the colored version after this and let it set up. The type of epoxy I use is dependent on how deep it needs to pour. This one's pretty shallow, less than a quarter of an inch or so, and I use tabletop epoxy. For deeper ones, I will use a deep pour epoxy, which cures a lot slower. My pouring process is to pour a little bit of epoxy, torch some of the bubbles so that we don't get any air in the epoxy, and then pour a little more and torch it, and kind of repeat until it overflows. After the epoxy cures, which takes about 24 hours with the tabletop epoxy or three days with the deep pour epoxy, I plane the top portion back to my initial stock size of two and a half inches deep. So once it's planed, it's time to go back to the CNC machine. I put a little bit of acetone on a rag and wipe the piece really well to get off any dust because I've had adhesion issues of the tape. I then put the tape on the bottom of my piece like I did before. I then put the CA glue on the bottom of my piece and use a little accelerator on my workpiece and glue the two pieces of blue tape together. I then indicate in the piece again. And like before, the orientation of the piece this time doesn't need super high precision. We don't need good precision until we're going to flip it over and do the other side of the bowl. Then start the machining process. The facing operation happens first, and then the 3 8 of an inch bit to rough out most of the material. And then we jump over to the quarter inch ball and nose mitt to do the finishing bits. So I didn't record the next steps with the actual bowl that we've been machining along, and I have the video footage from a different bowl, but the process is the same. I mount a vise to my table, and then I have a small 4x4 four four inch piece of plywood that I clamp in the vise. You could use a larger piece of plywood and just mount it to your table if you don't have a vise, and that will work too. The purpose of using a vise is that I'm going to indicate in the piece precisely for the second operation. And this is essential so that everything lines up just perfectly. For the hold down to the plywood, I just directly CA glue the bottom of my piece to the plywood. I tried using blue tape, but the adhesion wasn't good enough for the small surface area. And so I find it's better to directly glue the bottom of my bowl to a piece of plywood. So the top of the bowl has a little bit extra that was left over from the first operation where we did the bowl upside down. And if you recall in the CAD and the CAM design, we left that little extra portion at the bottom and we did a slight profile pass inset slightly to create a very precise rectangle. And the purpose of that is now going to be clear because we're going to flip the bowl upside down and the machine will have created a perfect location for us to indicate in on the second operation. If we didn't do this, any errors might build up from when we did the initial woodwork on the table saw, but now we know the CNC machine created the perfect uh, locations that we can indicate in for the second operation, which is also why we left a little bit of the top portion around, something we can go ahead and indicate in. 
So having explained that, what I do is I will use either the X or the Y axis and set the Heimer up so that it's reading some known value, about 5 thousandths in this particular image. And I'll run the X axis along and just tweak the vise until it's perfectly at uh, pretty much aligned, maybe within a couple of thousandths of an inch. And from there, I can zero out the X and Y. So as we watch the machining operation, I want to mention a couple of things. The 3 of an inch spiral upcutting bit is essential. The upcutting bit makes the chips come away from the center of the bowl and to not get stuck down. Even so, it's good to have a vacuum or air to get the chips out because I have had issues where the bit has gotten stuck because I forgot to turn on the air and actually pulled the piece off my table. So use caution here and maybe don't use large step downs. Start with small step downs like 100 thousandths of an inch or 150 thousandths of an inch to avoid any potential issues. So once the machining is finished, I will bring it over to the bandsaw and cut off that bottom portion of plywood, leaving just a little sliver on. And frequently the heat will build up and reduce the adhesion qualities of the glue and I can kind of pop the bottom off, otherwise I can sand it off. From there on, I sand the bowl by hand with usually a 220 and a 320. After that, I can apply a finish. This particular bowl is finished with boiled linseed oil, and it works pretty well, but will eventually wear away. So that's pretty much it for making this bowl. Thanks for following along, and hopefully you can go ahead and try and make one of these bowls yourself. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me. I'm glad to help. Uh, subscribe. It encourages me to make more videos. Thanks, everyone. Oh, and a side note. If you've been looking at this bowl in the video that I've been making, it has some text that I created in it for my son that says Ansel's Bowl. I'm going to upload the Fusion 360 file for this particular bowl in case you want to try and create your own using similar techniques. I left off how to make the text because it didn't really fit in with the tutorial. Thanks everyone.